Um, hello, I'm Quinn Brodsky, and today I'm going to be presenting about the optical trapping of pico newton sized dielectric objects for uh, Junior Lab. So let's start off with some theory. Um, although light is massless, it can still carry momentum, which is related to its uh, wavelength inversely. And this allows photons to transfer momentum to objects with which it interacts. And we know that this means that the photons impart a force on those objects, since classically the force is a the derivative of the momentum. Um, there are two forces that we have to consider here. Um, the first is a scattering force, which is due to the scattering of light off of an object. Um, and the object of interest here is a dielectric silica bead. And this causes a force in the direction of the laser's propagation. Um, the other force is called the gradient force, which is the force due to uh, the refraction of light from the object. And this acts in the opposite direction to the scattering force. Um, if we want to trap a bead between two opposing laser beams, as is the goal of this experiment, um, we need to ensure that these two forces cancel. And Arthur Ashkin in 1970 discovered the mechanics of these so-called optical tweezers. And since the lasers trap the bead, if you pull the bead away from equilibrium, um, the forces will restore it to the center. So the system acts as a harmonic oscillator. Um, and I've listed the equation of motion here. Um, note that I've excluded inertial terms, which is the MA terms, um, because at the pico-newton scale, these forces are negligible compared to the drag terms um, of the Brownian motion scale. So if we can figure out the spring stiffness of this oscillator system, we can actually ca calculate Boltzmann's constant, Kb, using the equal partition theorem, um, which is essentially a statement of the conservation of energy, where on the left-hand side here, we have the potential energy due to the spring, and on the right-hand side, we have the energy due to Brownian motion fluctuations. Um, so we did this experiment via a simulation, but I will briefly outline the, uh, the inspiration, uh, the, you know, the real experimental setup. Um, so we generate coherent infrared light, which is at a wavelength of 975 nanometers. And then we use a series of mirrors and lenses to focus the light into a tight 1.1 micron diameter. Um, and then we send this through a fiber optic cable to uh, a microscope stage. And our target sample uh, is trapped between the microscope objectives where it's suspended in a fluid between the two glass slides. And the light scatters and refracts off of the bead um, according to the dynamics which I just described. Um, and then the scattered light is sent off to a quadrant photo detector or a QPD, which records, records the voltages of the scattered light, um, which we can then translate into the position of the bead in the X and Y directions. Um, we can also visualize the process with a white LED and a CCD camera. Um, I will focus on using the analog of the QPD data, which is um, a set of X and Y positions in a CSV file um, from the simulation written by Junong. And uh, the simulation also produces a TIFF stack of images, which serves as the analog to the visualization with the CCD camera. Um, in the simulation, I fix the laser current to 200 milliamps, um, since the spring stiffness varies with the laser current, and I let the temperatures vary from 275 to 375 degrees Kelvin. I also fixed the sampling rate, which is the, how frequently the simulation takes the data in the CSV file. I fixed that to 5,000 hertz. Um, and then the frame rate of the TIFF images is 50 hertz. Um, and I also set the total runtime to 120 seconds. Um, and again, I'll focus on the CSV data and then my partner, John, um, has analyzed the image data. So once this data is acquired, we can calculate the Boltzmann constant in a couple of ways. Um, the first two I'm gonna explore in detail here. The third I will, um, I will relegate to future work. Um, and the first two methods are related because they use the same method of acquiring the spring stiffness, but they differ in how they calculate the Boltzmann's constant. So the way that we acquired the spring stiffness for uh, 200 milliamps was to plot the power spectral density of the position data, which is essentially the fast Fourier transform of the data. Um, and I used the SciPy signal Welch package to do this. Um, and then I performed a curve fit to the analytical form of the power spectral density, which I've listed here at the bottom. And, um, uh, and then the optimal fit values tell us uh, the optimal amplitude and spring stiffness. And I've shown an example here of, of this fit. Um, as we've figured out before, there are issues with propagating uncertainty in the position to the uncertainty in the frequencies. Um, and I just added this note, um, but we'll discuss this later. So what we get if we average over all of the acquired values for alpha for all the data sets is about 3.44 times 10 to the minus seven newtons per meter. And we can perform a quick sanity check to see if this result is reasonable by using the fact that the laser current and the spring stiffness are proportional, 
Um, so to the, for this, I started to vary the current from zero to from, um, from 50 to 500 milliamps and found many, many different alphas using the power spectral density method and then plotted those values against one another. And then we can calculate a best fit line here, which we see over here with the parameters listed, with the optimal parameters listed. And then if we put, plug in the value of the current that we have, uh, 200 milliamps, um, and we you know, multiply by the slope and add the, free, and add the um, offset, then we see that the value that we get from the best fit line is, is pretty much the same as what we got for um, the PSD fit. So we see that this is, is, is pretty useful. This will also be useful in future work, which I'll discuss in a little bit. So now that we have our values for alpha, we can calculate KB. And this first method, as I said before, um, is we're going to calculate the average squared values of the position by just taking a brute force average over time. So squaring the X, val X values and then um, averaging those over all of the samples. Um, and to do this, we use the equal partition theorem um, with a brute force uh, uh, X squared calculation. And then we get a value of 1.19 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Um, and the uncertainty here is listed by the, the standard deviation of all of the values for um, all of the data sets. Um, and this is a little bit lower than what we expect, and I'll discuss this in the error analysis. Um, the second method of calculating KB is instead of just taking a brute force average of the X squared values, we fit the position, position data to a Gaussian, which I've shown here to the right. Um, and we use the variance of the Gaussian instead of the average value of, of X squared. Um, and this is valid if we just expand the definition of the variance, which I've done right over here. Um, and if we assume that the average value of X is close to zero, um, which I'll verify in the next slide. Um, and then uh, we can just think of this as just self, like essentially centering the Gaussian at zero because the, the variance should not, should not affect where the Gaussian is centered. Um, so all we do is we, we replace uh, the average value of X squared with the variance of the data to calculate our new KB, uh, again, using the equal partition theorem. So the result that we get from doing this is pretty much the same as what we got for our first method, which is about 1.18 times 10 to the minus three uh, joules per Kelvin. Um, and this is still lower than we expect and is also almost the same as the, the brute force method that we listed first. Um, and the reason is, um, the reason that I decided to do this analysis was because I thought that the, the brute force X squared calculation would exclude some of the tails that might be included in the Gaussian just due to low statistics. But I think that if we look at the fit on the Gaussian here, we see that it's pretty close to the actual measured data. So the Gaussian and the measured data are essentially the same, so they would produce about the same results. Um, and then if we test the approximation that we made that the average value of X is about equal to zero, we can lift that approximation to see what happens if we don't have that approximation. And we, we get essentially the same thing. Um, so um, that assumption holds. So, um, Potentially the reason that the first analysis resulted in a lower value of KB, as I said, was because taking the, the average X squared values um, excludes the tails that might be included in the Gaussian. But as we compare that to the Gaussian, we see that the values are just about the same. And so um, we assume that this error is likely in the calculation of alpha, which um, we've discussed there's gonna be issues with propagation of the position into the frequencies. Um, and so I'll discuss how we might improve this in future work. But we also have to consider the systematic uncertainties. And since we're using the CSV data, which it ha has no built-in uncertainties into it, it's a little bit difficult to discuss what the systematic uncertainties would be for the system. But just for the exercise, I decided to say, what would my uncertainties be if I happen to have an uncertainty in the temperature and the position, um, like I've listed here. And I've just chosen uh, an error in the position of about half a Kelvin and an error in the position of, uh, the error in the temperature of about half a Kelvin and the error in the position of about half a micron. Um, and then we can propagate this using the uh, propagation of error equations, and we get an error of about 0.2 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Um, I'm not gonna include these values uh, in my final reported values because these aren't real uncertainties. This is just for the exercise of, if we did have the real experiment, what might these uncertainties look like? So to improve our calculation of alpha, we can use the linearity of the current, which I, which I listed earlier, um, to find an optimal value of alpha in conjunction with the power spectral density fitting method. And another method is we can fit the autocorrelation of the position over time, uh, which I've listed down here, which is uh, um, in, in, in the literature. Um, and the optimal fit values will also give us values for the spring stiffness. Um, and another really cool method of calculating uh, the Boltzmann's constant would be to use a Boltzmann distribution, um, and, uh, which I've written here, and then again, perform an optimal fit to try to find the parameters.
Um, and this method is also really cool because once you gather enough information about your alphas and your Boltzmann constants, you can sort of use it backwards as a, as a thermometer for uh, small scale fluctuations, which is kind of a cool, cool analysis. Um, and then again, we can try to gather multiple values of the Boltzmann constant for different values of the currents, uh, which correspond to different values of the spring stiffness. So why should you care about this, this experiment in the first place? Well, it blurs the boundaries between the microscopic and macroscopic realms. We're using thermodynamical equation, uh, information about the microscopic fluctuations to talk about macroscopic quantities like the Boltzmann constant. And usually these two areas of physics are treated rather separately, but here we kind of uh, were able to use the fundamental physics that governs both of these areas and figure out the connection between them. Um, and uh, we're using fundamental physics like harmonic oscillators and energy conservation to unify these two areas of physics, which I think is, is pretty neat. Um, thank you for listening. Special thanks to John and Professor Fockery. Um, are there any questions?